Greetings, friends and brethren. Today is a second part of a multi-part series that we're doing on the book of Deuteronomy, the book of the law. Why are we doing it? Because it says in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses uh, 10 through 13, every seven years at the Feast of Tabernacles, you're supposed to read the book of the law. So we began that. We got through chapter 4. And so today we're going to begin with chapter 5. So you've got your Bibles. You can follow along. Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting in verse 1. And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. So you notice they're told about these statutes and also be careful about observing them. Not just, oh yeah, I heard about them, whatever. Okay, that's not the attitude. The attitude was you should do what you're being taught. Verse 2, The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb, the Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with those who are here today, all of us who are alive. The Lord talked with you face to face in the mountain from the midst of the fire. I stood before the Lord and you at the time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire. You did not go up the mountain. And he said, and we're going to say what he said in just a moment. Of course, we weren't physically present, but you might recall that in the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Thomas historically now known as Doubting Thomas, said, well, if I see it, if I see the wounds in Jesus, I'll believe. And he finally got to, and Jesus said, you believe because you saw, blessed are those who believe who didn't see. So we were not there when the Ten Commandments were given at that time. But we hopefully will believe them. First one, verse 6, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. I would say this is definitely the commandment that's broken the most. People in a variety of faiths uh, who profess some version of Christianity probably all think they keep this one, but I think it's the one people break the most probably all the time. We always put stuff before God. We don't always think that we do, but we frequently do. Uh, and that was the first one that was listed. Basically, they try to get your priorities right. Verse 8, you shall make for you should not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that's in heaven above, or it's the earth beneath, or it's the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquities of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to those thousands who love me and keep my commandments. Oddly, I received an email uh, last night from an article Somebody explaining that, according to the New Testament, uh, venerating relics, or worshiping relics, was fine because the Bible taught that. What do you mean the Bible taught that? They gave two proofs. The proof was that one time somebody touched Jesus' garment and she was healed. Which I don't think has a, one thing to do with relic worship, but that was in the article. And there was one other one. When the Apostle Paul... Uh, prayed and sent an anointed cloth to people who couldn't get to him. They say, ah, that's proof of, re of relics. No, that's proof that there's a procedure that the Bible has if an elder can't get to you because the Bible says if you're ill, contact an elder and he'll pray for you. If he can't get there, there's another way we can do this. That was their proof from the Bible. And saying, those who are outside of the Greco-Roman faith who condemn this, how could you? Because it's from the Bible. It's not from the Bible. The Bible says don't venerate those kind of things. Don't worship them. But this is current. I realize this book was written a long time ago. But this was something that was uh, online the last couple of days. Again, I saw it uh, last night. because Somebody sent it to me. Verse 11. You shall not take the Lord, excuse me, the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And we have a situation where most of us will not directly curse. We, we understand that. But sometimes people do use euphemisms for God and take God's name in vain. Um, I should also say, for those who are out watching, since I'm not going to spend the entire sermon on the Ten Commandments, we do have a sermon at the Continuing COG channel uh, on the first four of the Ten Commandments. And eventually I intend to put one on the last six. So if you want more details on these first four, you can go there and, and watch that. Fourth commandment, verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor into all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. 
Now, a lot of people complain about this and consider this a particular burden, but you understand this is like one of the first employment laws. People got a day off. Okay, that wasn't normal. Okay, people just always worked. <laughs> uh, so this is first day off. We ended up with weekends, I think, because of this. Verse 14, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your st stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. Verse 15, Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So God commanded it, and we're doing it. Verse 16, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long, that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. So we see here this particular commandment, God is saying, look, it's going to be better for everybody if you people do this. As it said in the other portions of uh, the book of Deuteronomy, in the previous sermon, God says, these things I gave you for your good, to be better for you, so everything would work better for you. You shall not murder. There's a good one. People stop murdering, people wouldn't have to be afraid. Okay? We would have a lot less fear in this world. You should not commit adultery. Uh, if this particular command was kept, it would solve a variety of personal, social, and economic problems, uh, definitely in the Western world and probably in other ones. You shall not steal. Now, here's a great one. You know, steal. I've, oh, it's my other jacket. I always carry keys all the time. Why am I carrying keys? To lock things up. Why would I lock things up? Because someone might steal them. You know, you're considered stupid now if you don't lock certain things up. How dare you not do that? Don't you know? Well, I shouldn't have to. People shouldn't steal. But in this age, where Satan, the god of this world, predominates, you better have locks, keys, watch out for yourself, be, be concerned. But that's not the way it's going to be in the kingdom of God. People are going to understand this law and practice it. Verse 20, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You know, if this one was kept, people wouldn't get cheated. You could trust people, like all the time. Uh, as one who travels a lot, usually we run into people who are friendly enough to assist us. But sometimes maybe that's not super smart, but we do, do it most of the time. Um, and sometimes we get cheated and misled. But if actually, if, if this particular commandment was kept, you understand what we do for the uh, justice system, criminal justice system? Now I realize in the United States we have the Fifth Amendment that supposedly says you don't have to incriminate yourself. Well, the Bible doesn't actually allow that. Okay? I won't go there, but uh, there was a story in the book of Joshua. The Joshua uh, and the people went to fight against a small city they lost. Couldn't figure out why. They cast lots, figured out it was somebody. Went up to him and said, did you steal the cursed thing? And the guy said, yeah, I did it. He said, okay, you're dead. It's over. Uh, I'm not convinced that in uh, the United States, New Zealand, Australia, or most of the world, by the way, the Gentile world either, that if you ask somebody, did you steal this? They'll say, oh, yes, I did. They did. They may not be so upfront on about it. So we take care of a lot of problems including political ones. Uh, I've noticed that politicians have a tendency to say certain things, and sometimes they don't seem to keep their word. But they're not supposed to bear false witness. It means they're not supposed to go out and say things. Now, it's always possible that you might say something you intend and make a mistake. Okay, I can understand that. But if it's in your power to keep your word, you're supposed to try to keep your word. Politicians included. Verse 21. Now this one is one that most of the world doesn't think is a sin at all. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that's his neighbor. That's your neighbor's. Well, people don't think that coveting is wrong. Uh, the common expression is, uh, it's okay to look and not touch. Well, Jesus said, no, that's not true if you go to uh, the book of Matthew. Why does the Bible prohibit coveting? A couple of different reasons. First of all, it leads to sin. Secondly, because you're never going to be satisfied with what you have if you think you should have whatever other people have. 
You'll lead a better and happier life if you don't covet. Um, between verses 20 and 21, not bearing false witness and coveting, that would pretty much change the advertising world, or at least much of it. If they had to obey that. Wouldn't it be great if you could actually trust a commercial completely? Uh, in the United States, I've learned that when something says it's free, it doesn't necessarily mean free. It's free, but they also sign you up for something. Free, but you have to pay for this. Free, but you have to pay for that. No, I thought free means there's, it's like free. Okay. Uh, sometimes the English language is distorted by those who are trying to manipulate us because they covet what we have, which is unfortunate. Verse 22. These words the Lord spoke to all the assembly in the mountain and from the midst of the fire, the cloud and the thick darkness, with a loud voice, and he, had it, he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone, and he gave it to me. So Moses said, God told me this. He gave me these tablets, and I had them. Verse 23. So it was, when you heard the voice in the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near me, all the heads of your tribes and elders. And you said, surely the Lord our God has shown us his glory, his greatness, and we've heard his voice in the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God speaks with man, yet he still lives. Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, then we shall die. Now in the first part of this, these are the same people that said, oh, by the way, God, you brought us out of Egypt to kill us, to let us die in the wilderness. Okay? Now, if God didn't bring them out to kill them then, then God speaks to them. So it makes it clear that God's speaking. Now, better not hear that, we're going to die. These people keep coming up with excuses and things that God didn't say. We do as well. Ours are more subtle. They're not as dramatic. We lie to ourselves about God all the time. And they did too. Verse 26. For who is there of the flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we haven't lived? You go near and hear all that the Lord our God may say and tell us what the Lord our God says to you. And we'll hear it and we'll do it. Moses, we're not afraid of you. Okay, it's okay if you go and talk to God. If he destroys you, we'll take that chance. Sorry, Moses. But you can explain it. We're afraid. Verse 28. Then the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I've heard the word, voice of the words of this people which has spoken to you. They're right in what they've spoken. Oh, that they had such a heart that they would fear me and always keep my commandments. And it might be well with them and their children forever. So it would have been better if they would be willing to listen. But since they're not, I guess this is the way we have to do it. Go say to them, return to your tents, but as for you, Moses, stand here by me, and I'll speak to you all the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which you shall teach them, and that they may observe them in the land which I am giving them to possess. Verse 32, God says this again, Therefore you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you possess. So God is saying, if you'll pay attention to this, this is good for you. You will live longer. You will do better. Going into chapter 6. Now this is a commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you. So that's what we're supposed to be reading during the feast once every seven years. And that's what we're trying to do here. That you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. That you may fear the Lord your God to keep all the statutes and commandments which I command you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life. And by the way, I read some passages yesterday. It also includes daughters and women. That your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord your God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, I should comment here, I keep reading the word Lord, because that's what is spelled in English, but the actual Hebrew word is the word uh, Yahweh or Yahweh, and it means uh, the eternal one or the self-existing one, the one who is and will be. Uh, but since I'm reading an English translation, I'll read it as it's here. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, 
The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, with all your strength. And this is what actually the Old Covenant was supposed to be about, but the children of Israel didn't get it. But that's actually what the New Covenant is about. And there's a lot of people who profess Christ and they think they're in the Church of God, and they don't get it either. Uh, uh, love and how the law reflects love is a concept that some will mention, but they don't really believe, or they don't think it's important enough. But that's actually what it's all about. Verse 6, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. And that was the plan. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And we have some children here. And we try to diligently teach them to our children, the ones who aren't here as well. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So you're supposed to be teachers. You're supposed to at least teach your children these laws and these commandments. It doesn't matter if you're not a deacon or an elder or prophet or apostle or whatever other office we can come up with the Bible mentions. You're supposed to do them. Some of you are in the office of parent. And I won't flip to the New Testament for this right now, but those of you who are not, you're not exempt either. It says older men should teach young men how to behave, etc. And uh, unless you're the absolute youngest male or youngest female in this room, you're supposed to be te helping teach the people younger than you too. So, so another new office, a congregant, one who's attending church. <laughs> Anyway, verse 8. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on your doorposts of your house and on, on your gates. Now, we in our house literally do have the Ten Commandments up, but because with the New Covenant, it says the law is to be written in our hearts, we don't actually wear frontlets on our eyes. Okay? Some people do do that, and uh, they're welcome to do that. Uh, the problem I've noticed that those who tend to do that is they seem to miss the forest for the trees, to use an American expression. Um, they focus on that as opposed to what the law actually teaches. But again, it's not prohibited to do that if they wish. Verse 10. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your f fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and G Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, full houses full of good things which you did not build, fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig. I'm just commenting on that. We take for granted the fact we've got water. You turn the water out to on, tap water, it's easy. It was very difficult and very expensive to build wells. Okay? God's saying, look, this is the big deal. You're going to go to this land and I'm going to give you water. That was really a big deal because it was very, very difficult to, to live in those places without it. Vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then beware, lest you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and the house of bondage. Most of us, or many of us, who are going to be watching these videos live in Western cultures. We have electricity. We have food. We've got water. We have all kinds of things. It's easy to think, aha, we've done it on our own. Just, we don't have to thank God, think about God. But God was warning people that back then, and I think the warning is still applicable uh, today. Then you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. Now I was brought up Roman Catholic. And actually they have a different take on this. They actually believe, by the way, that God inspired the Greek philosophers prior to the time of Christ to come up with all kinds of uh, pagan beliefs, if you will, is what we would call them. So that would prepare them for Jesus Christ. And so they don't think it's wrong to observe the holidays of the heathen, which we just read you weren't, they weren't supposed to do. They say, oh no, God did this on purpose to prepare them. Which is one reason, by the way, in the continuing Church of God, we cover church history a fair amount. Why? Because the approach to tell Ro uh, Roman Catholics specifically and uh, Eastern Orthodox that they shouldn't have adopted something from paganism, they have an argument that they don't, they don't care. They think, no, this, they've been taught that it's okay. 
So, so one of the ways we're trying to reach them is to say, we disagree with you on that, but you claim that everything came from the Bible or the apostles, and we can show you from church history that the original church, the original Christian church, was not like the Roman Catholic Church. And some of the internet said, to, he was going against Protestants, he said, look at the Protestants, the original church was not Protestant, it was Catholic. Well, not their kind of Catholic, it was not. If you actually look at all the original teachings, they're Church of God teachings. Mm -hmm. And if you understand church history, you can show them, look, your leaders, or people you claim to be saints, mm -hmm. the ones who are faithful with Church of God leaders, taught this, and your church condemned it later. I'm hoping that between that and the Pagan Connection and other things, mm -hmm. that maybe we can reach out more and get them to pay greater attention. Because uh, we can quote Deuteronomy to them, and they've got their own argument. And so uh, my hope is, get them on all angles. Why should we do that? Because that's what Satan is going to do, and that's what Satan does do. During the time of the Great Tribulation, he's going to have persecution. He's going to have financial persecution. He's going to do a lot of things to get people to do it his way. And our side, we're going to stand for the truth and the Word of God, Give, explain a variety of reasons why people should do it God's way. As I'm reading through this law, this is God's way is the best way. And God's way is the way it's going to work. Verse 16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. In other words, no more come up with your own idols and such. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies, his statutes, which he has commanded you. Verse 18. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, that you may go in and possess the good land, which the Lord swore to your fathers, to cast out all your enemies before you, as the Lord has spoken. Verse 20. And when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What's the meaning of these testimonies, statutes, and judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and God showed us signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe, against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his household. He brought us out from there that he might bring us into the land which he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to observe all the statutes, to fear the Lord our God for good always, that we might preserve, uh, he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Verse 25. Then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all the commandments before the Lord our God as he had commanded us. And as I mentioned in the previous sermon in Psalm 119, it says all God's commandments are righteousness. Now you say, wait a second, we weren't slaves in Egypt. Not in physical Egypt, no, but in spiritual Egypt, we were. And keeping these laws help us understand God's way and what way is going to work best. Chapter 7. Verse 1. When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess, it has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor their daughter to your son. Why? For they will turn your son away from following me to serve other gods, so the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. I want to stop right there and just comment about it uh, to make sure this is clearly understood. In the continuing church of God, we do not believe that uh, any of us have the authority to marry believers and unbelievers. Okay? There is a potential exception to that, uh, which I hope I will perhaps cover uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. But the, the Bible says in the New Testament to not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Paul wrote that in Corinthians. That is consistent with what Moses was saying in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, other groups, for some reason, seem to have a different view of that. But uh, this is what the Bible teaches, and this is what uh, we practice in the continuing church of God. Verse 
uh, five. But thus you shall deal with them and shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images and burn their carved images of fire. God says, I don't want any pagan relics. So these are talking about relics. God says, I don't want any of them around. Just get rid of them. Destroy them. Burn them. And you know, in the New Testament, we see that they did that. They went and they burned books. You say, oh, that sounds like censorship. Well, there's some things that people aren't supposed to get themselves involved with. And while books these days don't cost that much money compared to the old days, I have no idea how long it would take to, to get a Bible back in the old, old days. My suspicion is it may take in a year or so of somebody's labor to do it. Maybe it was six months. I don't know, but it was a very long time, and paper was extremely expensive too. Now, now we have them, but these people burned expensive books. They could have made a lot of money on these books. And the Bible even gives some value in the New Testament about how many, what the value of books that were destroyed. But they did it because they understood they weren't supposed to keep pagan relics and be willing to destroy it if necessary. Why? Verse 6. For you are holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you because you were more in number than any other people, for you're the least of the peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, the land of Egypt, the king of Egypt, excuse me. What do we have in the continuing church of God? Are we the most mighty in terms of people, population? No. We're very small. God says he loves us anyway. He chose us because He loves us. And we're supposed to love Him. We're supposed to spread the love of God abroad. Which includes explaining God's rules, God's laws, His statutes, which are for our good. Repeatedly, through the book of Deuteronomy. I've read it today. I read it in the prior part of this ser sermon. They're for your good. And the Bible says it's good for us to know them. Verse 9, Therefore, know that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps you, excuse me, keeps the covenant and mercy for a thousand generations of those who love Him and keep His commandments. And He repays those who hate Him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack with them who hates Him. He will repay them to His face. Therefore, you shall keep the statutes and judgments which I command you today to observe them. Verse 12, Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments and do them, so not just showing up here and listening to me isn't what it's all about. You're supposed to do that, of course, and I appreciate you all being here. That the Lord your God will keep you the covenant, keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He'll bless the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your land, the grain, your new wine, your oil, the increase of your cattle, the offspring of the flock, in the land which he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all people. There shall not be a male or female barren among you or your livestock. The Lord will take away all sicknesses and afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt, which you have known, but will lay them in those who hate them. For example, if you don't disobey the law of adultery, you can avoid a lot of diseases these days. Verse 16, also, you shall destroy all the peoples whom the Lord your God delivers to you. Your eyes shall have no pity on them, you shall, nor shall you serve their gods, for they will be a snare to you. They would be a snare. God doesn't want people to, to keep them. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? Or at the time of the end, look, the king of the north power, it's pretty strong. How can we go against this? We're like nothing. And we to continue in the church of God have a pacifist leader who's not going to go take guns out and shoot them because we're going to rely on God. Verse 18, You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember well the Lord your, what your Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt, the great trials which your eyes saw, and the signs and wonders, the mighty hand and outstretched arm which, by which the Lord your God brought you out. So shall the Lord your God do to all the peoples whom you are afraid. As it said in the first few chapters of the book of Deuteronomy, God started to do that. Verse 20, Moreover, the Lord your God will send the hornet among them until those who are left 
who hide themselves from you are destroyed. You shall not be terrified of them. The Lord your God, the great and awesome God, is among you. He's a great and awesome God. And the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you little by little. And you will be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beasts of the field come upon you, become too numerous for you. Now, what's this got to do with us today? Well, we don't sometimes, well, we don't overcome all of our sins all at once. We don't overcome all our sins the day we were baptized. Sometimes it's a little by little. We have to build character. Some of these sins are in pretty deep. It takes a long time. Verse 23, But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you. Yes, if you have faith, if you continue, endure to the end. Jesus said to be perfect even as our Father in heaven is perfect. None of us, including me, are perfect. But we are to strive for perfection and go on to perfection, as it says in Hebrews chapter 6. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you and will defeat them, inflict defeat upon them until they're destroyed. He'll deliver their kings into your hands. You'll destroy their name from under the heaven. Until you are the one who will be able to stand against, no one will be able to stand against you until you destroyed them. You will burn the carved images of their gods with fire. You shall not covet the silver or gold that's in them, nor take it for yourselves, for lest it be a snare to you. So we're not supposed to come up with gold treasures that they, they had and reuse them to, for some purpose. But that's what the Greco-Romans did. Uh, the poor, members of our family are here today all have visited Parthenon in Rome. The Parthenon was a building built for the gods. And Emperor Constantine gave it to the Church of Rome. And now they have their versions of the gods in it. And now it's actually more of a Marian shrine. It's become more of a Marian shrine than it was in the past. At least uh, when we were there in 2013, uh, that's what it looked like compared to the time we were there uh, a few years before. And we were supposed to do that, lest we be snared by it. For it's an abomination to Lord your God. Nor shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it's an accursed thing. People were not supposed to do it. Verse 8, excuse me, chapter 8. Every commandment which I command you, today you must be careful to observe, that you may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which, of which the Lord swore to your fathers, you shall remember the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments or not. And that's what this life is all about. We are to build perfect and upright char right character. We are to overcome sin. That's what this life is about. So we, that, it's not what it's entirely about. We're actually to learn to love God and love our neighbor. But we do that by overcoming sin and going to tests and trials that are put before us. Verse 3. So he humbled you. And we're humbled. We're not in some massive church with uh, a big army behind it if we want or uh, the government supporting it. Um, we go to church on Saturday. We keep holidays other people have never heard of. They think it's strange. God has humbled you, allowed you to hunger, fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that you might uh, make man to know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. That's true. We have not been given physical manna, but we've actually been given the word of God. Those people didn't have all of it. At the most, if Moses had written it down, he had the previous four books, and even if he did, by this stage, there would probably be maybe one or two scrolls with it, not a lot, not a lot, enough for people who could get to it. You couldn't go on your uh, smartphones to look it up or on your computer to get it. People would have it. We have that now. And we get it every day. They only got man of six days a week. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. So that was a miracle because garments do wear out. But people think of it as a miracle. Why? Because it's not obvious every day if your clothes are wearing out. It's just over time. Some things that happen in our own lives aren't obvious, but over time. You should know in your heart that as a man chastises his son, so the Lord your God chastises you, chastens you. The Bible says in the New Testament, no chastening in the flesh seems good when it's happening. I don't like it. Maybe some of you do, but I doubt it. 
Again, this is how this again ties into the, into the New Testament. Verse 6. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in His ways and fear Him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley vines, fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land which you will eat bread without scarcity, which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. So God is telling, look, everything you're physically going to need, children of Israel, you're going to go to this land. Just do the right thing, and you'll have everything you need. Verse 10, when you've eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he's given you. And we should do that now. Verse 11, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes that I command you today. And I'm trying to do that as well today. Verse 12, Lest, when you've eaten and are full, and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and gold are multiplied, and all you have is multiplied, verse 14, when your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, in which the fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought you out, uh, water out of the flinty rock who fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers did not know that he might humble you that he might test you to do good in the end verse 17 then you shall say in your heart my power and my might have gained me this wealth verse 18 and you shall remember the Lord your God for it's he who gives you power to get the wealth that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers as is this day then it shall be, if you, by any means, forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day, you shall surely perish. And as Christians, we do not want to commit the unpardonable sin. We don't want to turn our back on the Holy Spirit. We do not want to forsake the way that God has given us. We want to obey it. As the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish, because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. You say, yes, but some of these people were, were heathen. These were heathen cultures. This was not good. Surely God will overlook the fact if I turn my back on him completely. Well, you might remember Jesus said to the Pharisees, it's going to be more tolerable to people of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than you. These were Gentiles who were doing things that they should not do. And their cities were destroyed. But we are not to neglect so great a salvation. Chapter 9. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go into dispossessed nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities great and fortified up to heaven. Now what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to reach the whole world as a witness. Matthew 24, 14. We're supposed to make disciples of all nations. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It says in the book of Revelation that people of all nations, tongues, etc. are going to eventually respond. This seems impossible for such a small group. But we need to do it and have the faith it's going to happen. Directly or indirectly on the internet last month, we, may, we reached over 5 million people. We had a meeting here yesterday talking about seeing what we can do to reach 50 million people, 100 million people, a billion people in a month. Do I know when that's going to happen? No, not yet. Is it going to happen? Oh, yes. It will happen. It may happen just very suddenly at the end, and maybe we'll have to be content to reach mere millions, which, considering our size... There are scriptures that talk about uh, one will put a thousand to flight or ten to ten thousand. We reach, we reach thousands for people, thousands of people, every person that's with us. And we, 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 we hope to reach more. We hope to reach over a million for everybody that's with us. We'll see. A people great and tall, descendants of Anakin, whom you know and whom you've heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? We've got to go against the big churches. 
Not that we're going against them, but we're trying to proclaim the truth, so they consider us to be against them. Therefore understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes before you as a consuming fire. He'll destroy them and bring them down before you, and you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord has said to you. So, but if, if we're successful, notice what it says in verse 4. Do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, it's because of my righteousness. Look, I am really top, the top dog. Everything is, I am so good. It's because I am such a great guy or gal. The Lord has brought me to possess this land. No, it's mainly because of the wickedness of those nations that God is driving them out before you. It's not because of your righteousness or the reparationness of your heart that you go to possess the land, but it's because of the wickedness of this nation that the Lord your God drives them out from before you, that he may fulfill the word which the Lord your God spoke to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and, uh, and Jacob. Now, I'd like to stop here for a moment. And I'd like to go to the... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my place. I'd like to go to the book of Joshua, chapter 5. There's an interesting story here. And uh, it displays a, an attitude that we all have. Now, without going through all the details, we know that Joshua was God's guy. We know that for amongst other reasons. I read in the first portion of the sermon, first part of the sermon, the first four chapters of Deuteronomy, that God said Joshua was his guy. Okay? So in Joshua chapter 5, starting in uh, verse 13, it says, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite of him, with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? Okay, wherever you are, are you on our side or our enemies? That's what we wonder. God, are you on our side? But notice the answer. Remember, Joshua was God's guy. There's no doubt that Joshua was God's guy. No, he said. But as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come down. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does the Lord say to my servant? Verse 15, the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandal off your foot, the place you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. This is apparently a visitation from the one that we know as Jesus Christ. Because angels don't allow themselves to be worshipped. And the presence of an angel doesn't make it holy ground. But the part I want to emphasize here is don't think just because you're in the church of God, just because you keep the commandments, it means God's got to be on your side. Now it does say if God is for us, who can be against us? The book of Romans. But the part we need to realize, it also says in the book of Romans, all things work together for good to those who love God, for those who are called according to His purpose. But we need to understand we need to be on God's side. It's God's side that we are to be on. As opposed to thinking, okay, God, you have to be on our side. You need to find out why doesn't it appear that God's on your side. Perhaps it's because you're not on God's side. And that's what we need to be doing. And that's part of why you're here today. All right, we're going to go back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter uh, 9. This time we're going to pick it up where I left off in verse 6. Therefore, understand that the Lord your God has not given you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, your stickness. People, verse 7, and we are stick-necked. Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you've come to this place. You've been rebellious against the Lord. He said, yeah, but we're not like the children of Israel. We haven't rebelled quite like they have. Okay, that's true. But they didn't have God's Holy Spirit. They didn't have the whole... Law, book of the law, and we still make mistakes. Verse 8. Also, in Oreb, you provoked the Lord to wrath, so the Lord was angry enough with you to have destroyed you. When I went up the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the cov covenant, which the Lord made with you, then I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. So that's not possible. So God must have sustained him. Verse 10. Then the Lord delivered you to 
delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were the words which God had spoken to you on the mountain in the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. Verse 11. It came to pass at the end of the forty days and forty nights, the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone with the covenant. Verse 12. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, go down quickly, for your people whom you brought out of Egypt have acted corruptly. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them, and they have made themselves a molded image. So God is saying, when a physical leader was gone, look what happened. And just because somebody's not looking over your shoulder, you're not supposed to do the wrong thing. Part of having perfect character is to do the right thing when there's nobody around to tell you to do the right thing. And how are you supposed to know the right thing? By, by hearing the Word of God taught, by studying the Word of God, obeying the Word of God, and praying to God for strength and assistance. Verse 13. Furthermore, the Lord spoke to me, saying, I have seen this people, and indeed they are stick people. Let me alone, and I may destroy them, and blot their name out from under heaven, and I'll make you a nation mightier and greater than they. So God gave Moses the ultimate. I'll make you the great one, your people, your everything. And Moses was occasionally accused of, you know, he's up front. Moses is just trying to strut his stuff and whatever. They accused him of vanity and he wanted all this. Moses didn't want that. Just because someone's a leader doesn't mean that that's what they want. Verse 15. So I turned and I came down from the mountain and the mountain burned with fire and the two tablets of covenant were in my hands. And I looked and behold, you had sinned against the Lord your God and you had made for yourself a molded calf. We have our own types of molded calves in modern society. You had turned aside quickly from the way which the Lord your God had commanded you. Then I took the two tables and I threw them out of my two hands and I broke them before your eyes. And I said to God, Okay, God, I'm the guy. Make me the guy. No, he didn't say that. And I fell down before the Lord as the first 40 days and 40 nights I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin which you committed and doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord is angry with you to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me at that time also. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him. So I prayed for Aaron also at the time. So he was a compromising leader. He did kind of what the people wanted to do. God was not happy with that. Verse 21, Then I took your sin, the calf which you had made, and burned it with fire, and crushed it, and ground it very small, as fine as dust. I threw the dust in the brook that descended the mountains. Verse 22, Also at Tibera, and Masa, and Kirath, and Hattah, you provoked the Lord to wrath. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and possess the land which I have given you, then you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and you did not believe him, nor obey his voice. You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day I knew you. Verse 25. Thus I prostrated, excuse me, prostrated. Prost, a prostate is a, 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 a part of a male anatomy. A pro, being prostrated means to lay on the ground. So I prostrated myself before the Lord. Forty days and forty nights I kept prostrating myself because the Lord had said he would destroy you. Therefore I prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord God, do not destroy your people and your adherents whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. It's appropriate for us to pray for other people too. You don't have to be Moses to do that. And you should do that. Verse 27. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not look on the stubbornness of this people or on the wickedness of their sin, lest the land from which you brought us should say, because the Lord was not able to bring them to the land he, which he promised them, because he hated them, he brought them out to kill them in the wilderness. Yet they are your people and your inheritance, whom you brought out by your mighty hand, by mighty power and your outstretched arm. So Moses is continually reminding people what happened. I'm not here to continuously remind you of everything that happened in your life. I don't know all the tests and trials that you've had. I don't know all the blessings that you've had. That's just something you might want to consider from time to time to help motivate you to continue to go forward. Chapter 10. 
At that time, the Lord said to me, Hew for, for yourself two tablets of stone, like the first, and come up to me on the mountain and make an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words which were in the first tablets which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone, like the first, and went up the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spoke to you from the mountain in the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. Again, this term, Ten Commandments, actually was the word Ten Words. Later, it started to be called the Ten Commandments, but it were actually originally referred to in Hebrew as the Ten Words. And to me, that's an interesting uh, assessment of them. Because there's lots of words in this Bible. Quite a few words. I'm reading a lot of words today. There's a lot of words that we're supposed to learn. But there were ten that were called the Ten Words. The Ten Words were not just for the Hebrews back then. The ten words were for all time. In this particular sermon, I'm not going to go through this, but uh, there are actually articles at the www.cogwriter.com website to show that the Ten Commandments were before Moses uh, uh, spoke at uh, Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments. They already had existed. Job, who preceded it, kept, kept them. And he mentions at least two or three of them. Uh, some of which perhaps would not be considered common sense, at least by the Gentile population. Others have said that the Ten Commandments were done away, uh, or nailed to the cross. We've got articles about there explaining that as well. Jesus kept the Ten Commandments. The people say, well, yeah, he kept them because he had to. Yeah, but he also kind of wrote them <laughs> as he wanted to. So were they called the Ten Words or the Ten Commandments? Verse 5, Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark, which, which I had made, there just as the Lord commanded me. Now the children of Israel journeyed from the wells of ben Jachin to Moserah, where Aaron died, and there he was buried, and Eleazar, his son, ministered as a priest in his steed. From there they journeyed to uh, Gugada, and from Gugada to Jabatha, the land of the rivers, at the water. At that time... The Lord separated the tribe of Levi to uh, bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister to him, and to bless his name to, his, to this day. Therefore, the Levite has no portion or inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance, just as the Lord your God promised him. Well, in the New Testament, we read that Jesus, who was a Jew, he was not a Levite, uh, was, was our, is our high priest now. And that there was a change from the political priesthood to the ministry in the New Testament. Which is one of the things that uh, sometimes uh, tithes and offerings may be used for. Verse 10, as at the first time I stayed in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord also heard me at that time, and the Lord chose not to destroy you. So God can apparently change his mind if you're diligent enough. But most of the time we're not diligent enough. That's why I was saying before that the commandment that's broke the most is the first commandment. People put things before God. We're not diligent enough. We won't endure enough. We make excuses too. Surely God, you wouldn't make it so hard or so complicated for me. So I just, I'm just going to give up. Surely God, if we're right, we wouldn't run into technical problems. Uh... Surely, God, there would not be noise interruptions ever when we do sermons. Okay? Uh, surely, God, uh, my paycheck wouldn't be late. Etc., etc., etc. Tests and trials come up on us all the time. Verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord require of you but to fear the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? And to keep his, the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for this, for your good. That's what we're supposed to do. If we do that, the Bible says God is faithful that he, he who's begun a good work in us will finish it. Don't give up. Yes, things take longer than we think they should take a lot. You say, well, that proves we're totally carnal. No, not necessarily. 
The Bible has things where a lot of people said, Oh, Lord, how long? So uh, that was apparently expected. Verse 14. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth and all that's in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all the peoples, as it is this day. Now verse 16. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. For the Lord your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, a great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality, nor takes a bribe. Let's stop there for a moment. Jesus said it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get to heaven. But the Church of Rome says if you give enough money to the priests when you die, they can pray you out of a place they call purgatory, and you get out there way quicker. You can cut off hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of years off your time in purgatory. Well, I don't think God takes a bribe. The Bible says God doesn't take a bribe. And Jesus said it was harder for a rich man to get to heaven. But some don't understand that. Verse 18. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. Yes, we should try to love people who are not part of our fellowship. People wondered about that. Jesus told a parable. He told a particular parable that we call the parable of the Good Samaritan. But until we think, when we use the term Samaritan, we think that's a good thing. That's not how the Jews viewed it. Oh no, the Samaritans. We don't have any dealings with those, with them. How do we know that? It says in the Bible. When Jesus talked to the one with the well, he says, how come you're a Jew talking to us? You know, Jews don't have to deal with the Samaritans. But I grew up thinking Samaritans were all really good. Uh, I hadn't read all that. I didn't know the Jews didn't like them. I, didn't know, I thought Samaritan just meant you were a good person. I found out that Samaritan was a mixed per Gentile type of person back then. And you say, well, I know the story of the good Samaritan. Well, I'm going to mention it again anyway. There was a man. We don't have to go to the past scriptures. I've been reading scriptures quite a bit. I know this story well enough that I don't have to turn to the Bible to look, look it up. There was a man, he got beaten. He was left by the side of the road. For dead, he took his money, whatever he had. And the uh, Pharisee comes by. A great religious leader comes by. Sees the guy, goes on the other side of the road, goes around him. He didn't do anything about it. Then a Levite, a priest came by. A presbyter came by. So like an elder comes by, ignores him. Uh, we don't know if this guy was a Gentile or Jew, Samaritan. We don't know what he was. Jesus didn't really say. He just says he got beaten up and left for dead. So what happens? Samaritan comes by. He says, ah, ooh, this is all disgusting people who don't like us. So I'm going to uh, kick some dirt on him. No. Picked him up. Put him on his uh, donkey or horse, whatever it is he had. Brought him to an inn. Said, here's some money. Give him what he needs. If he needs more than that when I come back, I'll take care of him. You know, Jesus told that particular parable before the New Testament was written. Because he had some idea what the Old Testament was trying to teach us. And he did that, by the way, in response to the question, who is my neighbor? Because someone came up to Jesus and said, you know, what, what are the commandments and what's the greatest thing I can do? And he said, you have to love your neighbor yourself. Well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus said, oh, here's the story. So if you don't think it's some down and out person, it very well could be. Verse 20. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him. And to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. He is your praise. He is your God who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. What great and awesome things have you done for us? He showed us the right way to live. He's helped build character in us. We're all going to die at some point in time. And you're not physically going to take with you what you had. But spiritually, the character you develop will help serve you and others all eternity. 
Verse 21, He's your praise, He's your God, who's done these great, awesome things which you've seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt with 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as the stars of heaven in multitude. So they were a small people, a small group, and they became a horrendously big group. Chapter 11. Therefore you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, his commandments always. And as it says in Hebrews 13, 1, we are supposed to let brotherly love continue. Interestingly, when I was with my prior uh, association, um, we've been, uh, one of our sons and I were asked for some suggestions of what they should do with their website. And we came up with a couple of scriptures that they, we thought that they should have. And that was about a year or so before uh, the Continuing Church of God formed. So I basically forgot all about it because they didn't do anything with it, even though they asked for that information. And so it turns out we're working on our website, and I came up a couple of things to put there, and uh, had uh, one of our sons, actually two of our sons have helped upload different parts of the website. And our oldest said, Dad, that's what you had suggested to the other church about a year and a half ago, the same scriptures. I said, oh. Well, I said, that, the reason that's interesting to me right now, and the two scriptures, by the way, uh, where Jude contend earnestly for the faith once for all over the saints, and the one in Hebrews, let brotherly love continue. I picked it the second time for lots of reasons, including the fact this is continuing church of God. I thought that was a great term to use. But apparently, when I had no idea that the church of God would form as a continuing church of God, I thought that was a good script for, for, for people who claim to be Philadelphians to use. Because it it's actually says, let Philadelphia love continue, is what that passage says. So I thought it was a good idea a year and a half ago. And apparently, about a year or so ago, almost a year ago, when we, uh, when we worked on this. Verse 2, Know today that I do not speak with your children who have not known and have not seen the chastening the Lord your God in his greatness, his mighty hand, and his outstretched arm, his signs and his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt, to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and all his land, which he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses, their chariots, how he made the waters, the Red Sea, overflow as they pursued you, and how the Lord destroyed them to this day. What he did for you in the wilderness until you came to this place, and what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, their households, their tents, and all the sustenance that was in their possession in the midst of all Israel. But your eyes have seen every great act to which the Lord, which he did. Now we haven't seen every great act God has done. I'm not going to take the time to go there, but you might re recall there was a passage, I think it had to do with Elisha, it's either Elijah or Elisha, uh, where this great army came and they were all afraid. And Elisha said, God, open the eyes of my servant. He sees the armies of the host of God out there. He didn't know that God had this plan. We don't know how often God prevents an accident from happening when we're driving or from Satan from doing something that he wants to do. We have to walk by faith, not by sight, as the Apostle Paul wrote. So sometimes it's not as obvious. These people saw but still really didn't believe. And Jesus said, Blessed is he who believes who didn't see. Verse 8, Therefore you, you shall keep every commandment which I command you this day, that you may be strong and go to possess the land. Where was I here? He's going to prolong your days in the land which the Lord your God gives to your fathers a land flowing with milk and honey, for the land which you're going to possess is not like the land of Egypt which you've come, where you sowed your seed and watered it uh, by foot as a vegetable garden. That's a lot of work, by the way. I don't think you've carried water, but carrying water is really difficult. I used to help take care of horses, and I used to have to carry water buckets. Uh, I was not a big guy, and five-gallon water buckets were really heavy. <laughs> then imagine you have to do this on your, to get your food all the time. But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks water from the rain of the heaven, a land which the Lord your God cares. 
The eyes of the Lord are always on it, from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. And it shall be that if you carefully observe my commandments, which I command you today to love the Lord your God and serve Him with all your heart and all your soul, then I'll give you rain in your land for its seasons, the early rain, the latter rain. You may gather in your grain, your new wine, your oil, and I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Take heed to yourself, lest your heart be deceived. You turn aside and you serve other gods and worship them, lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you and he shut up the heavens so there'll be no rain and the land shall need yield no produce and you perish quickly from the good land which God has given you. So again, God keeps repeating the same thing. And apparently God wants to hear this often. And apparently God wants all of us to hear this at least once every seven years during the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's why we're doing it. We might say, well, there's other subjects that perhaps may be of more interest. I could talk about more prophetic subjects. And probably next year at the Feast I will do so. But one of my favorite scriptures that I live by, I try to live by, is Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean out your understanding and all your ways acknowledge Him. He'll direct your paths. He says to do this. Somehow, we're also stiff-necked. Stiff, stiff I'll get that word right. We need to hear it more often. Verse 18. Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign in your hand. They shall be as frontless between your eyes. So, by having them in our heart, it, that pretty much functions as the frontlets between our eyes. You shall teach them your children, speak to them when you sit in your house, and you go by your way when you lie down and you rise up. You're always supposed to set the right example for your children and to teach them. Verse 20, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates that are and that your days and your days of your children may be multiplied in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them like the days of heaven above, above the earth. Verse 22, For if you carefully observe these commandments which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, to hold fast to them, then the Lord will drive out all of these nations from before you. You will dispossess greater and mighty nations than yourself. Every place in which the sole of your foot treads you shall be yours. From the wilderness of Lebanon, from the river Euphrates down to the western sea shall be your territory. Now the western sea, that's the uh, Mediterranean Sea. No man shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will put the dread of you and fear of you upon all the land which you tread, just as he said to you. So God has a plan. Verse 26. Well, actually, verse 25. You know, it says, No man's going to be able to stand against you. As I mentioned before, as it says here, Fear not, little flock, for it's your, gather, your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Verse 26. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. Now, when we talk about prophecies, at this stage, when I'm in Deuteronomy, most of the time I'm talking about the curses. Uh, because we see what's happened to the land that the descendants of the children of Israel were given to possess. We're talking about blessing and curse, verse 27. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you to stay. And the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you to this today, to go after other gods which you have not known. Nor no, no. Now it shall be, when the Lord your God has brought you to the land which you ought to possess, that you shall put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Verse 30. Are not they on the other side of Jordan toward the setting sun in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the plain opposite Gilead beside the terebinth trees of Morah? For you will cross over the Jordan, go to possess the land which the Lord is going to give you, and you will possess it, and you'll dwell in it. And you shall be careful to observe the statutes and judgments which I give you to this day. We are here during the Feast of Tabernacles to learn the statutes and the judgments. Verse 12. These are the, excuse me, chapter 12, said verse, the chapter. These are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord, God of your fathers, 
is given you to possess after all the days you live on the earth. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods. You're not supposed to have relics. You're not supposed to have things around you that cause you to sin. If you have a problem with alcohol, even though we allow the consumption, moderate consumption of alcohol, don't have any alcohol around. So this is not just talking about having idols. You're not supposed to have things that may cause you to sin. On the high mountain, and on the hills, and under every green tree, Verse 3, you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods, destroy the names, their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord their God with such things. But we now have people who do so. We have people who profess Christianity who think that's good. It's not. We're not supposed to do it. <laughs> Verse 5, but you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to place his name there for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. Now this isn't specifically talking about the Feast of Tabernacles right here, but there's other passages in the book of Deuteronomy and elsewhere that say where to go to where God wants his people to go, to that place to learn God's law. Verse 6, there you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave of offerings of your land, your vowed offerings, your freewill offerings, your firstborn of your herds and flocks. Notice Actually, this was talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. Notice all these type of offerings. Verse 7. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all which God, which God put in your hand, you and your households, which the Lord your God has given you. Verse 8. You shall not do as we do here today, every man doing what is right in his own eyes. In other words, every man breaking the first commandment, not putting God above all gods. For as yet you have not come to the rest inheritance which the Lord your God has given you. And that's the same for those of us in the Church of God. We're looking forward to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ and the millennial rest. We're not there yet. But you cross over the Jordan to dwell in the land which the Lord your God has given you to inherit. In our case, we cross over into the millennium. We'll have rest from the enemies all about. And you'll dwell there safely. And it will be there a place where God will choose His name. His name will abide. And you'll bring all he commands, various tithes, burnt offerings, sacrifices, and heave offerings. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God and your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, the Levites who is within your gate, since he has no portion or inheritance with you. Take heed yourself. You do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see. Uh, try to support the true work of God. But in the place which the Lord chooses, in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your offerings, and there you'll do what I command. So, we take up offerings, of course, in the continuing church of God to, to support the work of God. Verse 15, However, you may slaughter and eat meat within your gates, where your heart desires. The clean and the unclean may eat of it. So I want to comment on that. The first time I read that, I thought this meant we're so, we, were, we could eat unclean meat. But what this means is, if you're ceremonially, un, ceremonially unclean, you're still allowed to eat. Okay? Of the gazelle and deer alike, which are again clean animals, only you shall not eat the blood and pour it. On, you're to pour it on the earth, like water. You may not eat within your gate the tithe of your grain, the tithe of your oil, the firstborn of your herd, or the firstborn which you vow of your free oil offerings. Verse 18. But you must eat them before the Lord your God in the place which the Lord your God chooses. You and your son, your daughter, your male servant, pay your male servant, the Levites within your gates. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God into all which he put into your hands. Take heed to yourself, you do not forsake the Levite as long as you live in the land. But you see, this is again talking about second tithe, uh, which we save to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, which is what we're doing uh, here. The sermon, for those of you who are watching it at a later date, was given during the Feast of Tabernacles in 2013. This is actually uh, uh, September uh, uh, 20th, uh, uh, 2013. Verse 20, when the Lord your God enlarges your border as he promised you and you say, let me eat meat because you long to eat meat, you may eat as much as your heart desires. If the place the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, you may slaughter your herd and your flock, which the Lord has given you just as I have commanded you, and you may eat within your gate as much as your heart desires, just as the gazelle and the deer are eaten, again, clean animals, so you may eat them, the clean and the unclean people alike may eat them, only be sure you do not eat the blood, for the blood of the 
is the life, and you may not eat the life with the meat. You shall not eat it, you shall pour it on the earth like water. You shall not eat it so that it may go well with you and your children after you when you do right in the sight of the Lord. Only the holy things which you have and your vowed offerings you shall take to the place that the Lord chooses. You shall offer your burnt offerings, the meat and the blood, on the altar of the Lord your God. And the blood of the sacrifice shall be poured out on the altar of the Lord your God, and you shall eat the meat. Observe and obey all these words which I command you, that may go well with you and your children after you, that you may do which is good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. So it's appropriate at the Feast of Tabernacles to go out and eat meat. It's one of the things that specifically says. It's appropriate to go to the Feast of Tabernacles because the place that God's chosen to place his name. And we're to learn God's law. Verse 29. When the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations which go to dispossess and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed yourself you're not ensnared to follow them. Notice God is repeatedly rewarding this. Now see, some people want to hear this over and over and over again. I didn't write the Bible. The Bible says I'm to do this. So these are something apparently we need to understand so we know it's it's not all right to have pagan relics. It's not all right to, to have a little sin around. Not all right to uh, unduly tempt yourself. Verse 30. Take heed yourself that you're not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed but before you that you do not inquire after their God saying, how do these nations serve their God? I will do likewise. Yeah. There must be other ways that people have church than what we do in the church of God. Maybe we should adopt all those. Verse 31. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters and fire to their gods. Now, that was actually a pagan practice. They thought that uh, they needed to appease the gods that they would have to uh, uh, sacrifice their children into fire, which is something that they tended to do in uh, their, their winter holiday. Verses of which are kept now, but without that part added to it. Verse 32, which is where we'll close for today. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. Do not add to it nor take away from it. We're to obey God's voice. We're to obey what God says. We're here to learn the laws of God, not just to listen to them, but to also to practice them and to place them, put them into our practice into our own lives.